Hi, Krishna, dear devotees. Welcome back once again to our ever ongoing series on the glories of our most beloved Sri Vrindavan Dham. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pacharane Nivishesha Shunyavadi Pastracha Deshatarane All glories to Sridhar Prabhupada. I'd also like to recite another prayer uh, to Sridhar Prabhupada. <clears throat> o beloved spiritual master, you are always in the presence of the cowherd girl, Sri Radha, the daughter of the king, Rishabhanu. Please award me service at your lotus feet, which are the proprietors of devotional service. Please place me in the ocean of joy by bestowing upon me happiness in the mellows of service at the feet of Sri Radha, in the groves of Sri Vrindavan Dham. Hare Krishna. So today we are continuing with our mini-series on stimulation for ecstatic love, and this will be part 18, number 18. As we mentioned one time, such discussions are a perfect way to begin the day. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur liked uh, to quote the following verse from the Narada Bhakti Sutras. Tadinam durdi namanye, mega chanam na durdinam, yadinam krishna samlapa, katapi yusha varjitam. A cloudy day is not inauspicious, but a day devoid of discussing Krishna kata is inauspicious. Hare Krishna. So in this series, we've covered uh, different types of stimuli which can help to develop our love for Radha and Krishna as well as awaken a firm desire in our hearts to be part of the divine pastimes. So far we've spoken on such items as uh, flowers, blankets, uh, we did Krishna's flute, peacock feathers, and, and birds. Each and every object in Braj, whether moving or stationary, living or non-living, is connected to, uh, to the pastimes of the Lord and therefore helps us to remember the divine couple. And when a devotee comes to the point of constantly remembering Shmaranam, the Lord, uh, in loving devotion, then he's finally come to the stage what we, what we would describe as samadhi. That's our defi definition of samadhi, to always remember the Lord in loving devotion. So today I would like to continue our previous discussions on the birds of Vrindavan by introducing you to the Chakva and Chakvi birds. The Chakva and Chakvi birds. The Chakva is a male, uh, I saw a photograph, with a black line on its neck, similar to, I guess you could say, a black ribbon. And the Chakvi is his female counterpart, but she doesn't have a, that black line on her neck. That's how you distinguish the two. They're kind of golden in color, actually. Now, they're known in Vrindavan as Dampati Pakshi. Dampati Pakshi, which means married birds. <laughs> Both in Shastra and amongst, I guess you could say, present-day bird watchers, Chakva and Chakvi are famous for their intense love for each other. Because of this attachment to each other, they actually can't live without each other. Therefore, they're almost always seen together. And whatever food one bird gets, he shares it with the other through his or her uh, beak. And they're often seen on the banks of, of Vrindavan's lakes and small ponds and other bodies of water. Um, and they're known as Jal Jivanas. Jal Jivanas, meaning literally, whose lives are water. Jaljivanas, whose lives are water. Therefore, sometimes people mistake them <laughs> for ducks, but they're not ducks. Actually, they're better known as lovebirds, lovebirds, and are most famous for love and separation. For when the day ends and the, the sun begins to set, they become very anxious at the prospect of not being able to see each other in the darkness of night. In fact, I was reading, they start crying as if they're going to be separated forever. 
you can just imagine. They're so intensely involved. They love each other so much, so they start crying like they're going to be separated forever. Some accounts say that the male chakva, he uh, spends the night in the forest, where the f- whereas the female chakvi, she flies away a little bit and she spends the night waiting on the banks of a nearby lake. Then when the sun rises the next day, these lovebirds fly to meet each other as if they're meeting for the first time, which is very much the mood in Vrindavan, as we've often described. Krishna's pastimes are always as if the first time. So these birds exemplify that. Now, the Acharyas say that uh, in the evening, they make a nice comparison here, in the evening when Radha and her girlfriends hear the Chakva and Chakvi birds, crying at this prospect of separation, they too become anxious at the prospect of separation from Krishna. (laughs) They also become anxious. Oh, maybe we're going to be, what's going to happen when we're separated from Krishna? Wow. So when this happens, Shirada actually runs to meet Krishna at Vamsivat, where he's playing his flute. And the poet, our poet, because we quote him so many times, Surdas, describes this very beautifully in one of his poems. He writes, Shirada, while listening to the cries of the Chakva and Chakvi, becomes overwhelmed and her heart begins to instruct her mind as follows. Her heart begins to instruct her mind as follows. O Chakvi bird of my mind, please take me to the lake known as Charan Sarovara, the lake of the nectar of Lord Krishna's lotus feet where there is no illusion of separating at night and where there is no pain of separation. Take me to that Sarovara where Lord Shiva and the sage Sanaka are the swans, where other sadhus are the fish, where lotuses bloom and where there is no fear of night, even for the duration of the blinking of an eye. Where the bees chant the divine hymns of the Nigama literature, where... uh, She says, liberation is easily available and where everyone drinks the nectar of good deeds. O mind, leaving that sarovara behind, why are you sinking here, sinking in in the ocean of unfulfilled desires of love for Krishna? Go now to that sarovara where the goddesses of fortune play in the waters. Surdas says, Radha, who is like a chakvi bird, cannot live without the charana sharova of Lord Krishna. That's so nice. Now, in a similar mood, uh, another of our favorite poets, uh, Lalit Kishor, he writes in his um, poem, it's called, let me remember, Vihan Gamlila, Viha, Vihan Gamlila, quote, It is said that the crying of the chakvi and chakva birds is the sound that indicates the time of meeting once beloved. So do not cry, Radha. Uh, Run immediately towards the groves of Vrindavan where Manmohan Krishna is waiting for you. These poets give us great access into the deeper understandings of Krishna consciousness. Now, just as the sound of the crying of the chakva and chakvi birds fills the heart of Sri Radha with, you know, vipralamba bhav, with feelings of separation, another bird, another famous bird, the cuckoo bird of Vrindavan, fills the heart of Sri Radha with feelings of happiness, with the sound of its sweet singing, of the loving affairs of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna when they meet, Sambhog, when they meet. So the cuckoo birds of Vrindavan, they're, they're dark in color, which it said um, served to remind all the gopis of Krishna. And the cuckoo birds uh, who sing in high pitches, these cuckoo birds, are actually considered to be the uh, king and queen of singing in the Vrindavan forest. They sing in high pitches, high notes. And no bird, I was reading, can sing more beautifully in Vrindavan than the cuckoo bird. I read that when the cuckoo birds sing, all the other forest birds, and there are just so many different types, who also sing very nicely, they become quiet and listen to the sweet, how's it described, 
intoxicating sounds of the cuckoo birds which reverberate through the trees. Now, because of being black, uh, with red beak and red eyes, the, the cuckoo bird is often compared to Krishna with his dark complexion, his, uh, his red lips and his reddish eyes. And because he uh, very beautifully can play his flute in high pitches. Remember the cuckoo bird, they sing in high pitches, high notes. Now here's an interesting note. Sometimes the famous uh, papiha bird, there's a bird called papiha. Uh, this bird sometimes sings along with the cuckoo bird, filling in between the cuckoo's notes because the notes are separate, of course. So this papiha bird, he or she, um, fill in between the cuckoo's notes with a sound like pihu, pihu. Of course, I can't do it properly. <laughs> not a, not a, one of those um, one of those papilla birds, but the sound is something similar to pihu, pihu, which is a low pitch sound. Cuckoos sing in high pitch, and this uh, particular bird sings in a low pitch sound, which in brush basa means beloved. So, beloved, beloved. And the Acharyas say that the combination of the papiha and the cuckoos, lower and high-pitched sounds, reflects two stages of love. Reflects two stages of love, which are, number one, uh, love in silence, and number two, bold and daring love for Krishna. Now those gopis, the Acharyas describe, those gopis who are bound by household duties, and cannot go out uh, independently to dance with Krishna are the reflection of the lower pitch sound of the papiha bird, or love in silence, because they can't leave home, so love in silence. And gopis like Shiradha, Lalita, and Vishaka are a reflection of the higher pitch notes of the cuckoo bird, in which their love is considered bold and daring in the service of Krishna. Hare Krishna. Now, an interesting fact is that the uh, cuckoo birds, they know how to sing in various ragas. Remember, they're not ordinary birds. They're self-realized sages. Well, they're pure devotees of Radha and Krishna. So the cuckoo birds, they can sing in, in, in ragas, like uh, the Ramakali raga, like the Malkons raga, like the Baha raga, and there's one more. Uh, the, the Bhima Palasi Raga, which are all sung in higher pitched notes, and which bring a, 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 a sense of joy and excitement to the hearts of the Braja Gopis in hopes of meeting and seeing Krishna very soon. <laughs> so the birds have a nice service. Now, there's one Shastra we used to quote a couple of years ago. It's called the Shubha Shita Ratna Banda Garam long name, Shubha Shita Ratna Bandagaram. Therein it said that um, a Vaishnava is supposed to be like a cuckoo, meaning he or, should be a, he or she should be a connoisseur of art and music. But that Shastra points out that if and when a Vaishnava finds himself in an assembly that doesn't appreciate you know, culture, arts, or fine music, uh, that Vaishnava should keep silent. The Sanskrit is Baddham Kritam Kritam Maunam Koki Lair Jala Dhagame Dar Dura Yatavaktaras Tatamonam Hi Shobanam. Translation O Kuku, it's so nice that when the rainy season arrived, you started observing perfect silence. Because when frogs become the prominent noisemakers in Vrindavan, that silence is golden. <laughs> so the import, the charyas give the import, is that when arasikas, arasikas means uh, non-connoisseurs of art, are given, in, uh, prominent, are given prominent places in society, you know, they're always speaking, they're important persons, they're always speaking, drowning everyone out with whatever they're saying, the saintly Vaishnavas should observe silence. Now the Supa Sita Ratna Bandagaram also goes on to say that even though Vaishnavas are like cuckoos, 
they should not always shy away from showing their qualities of speaking or singing nicely. Otherwise, people will never know what true art, music, and literature is. And there's a nice Sanskrit verse in that uh, book as well. Re re kokila mabhaja maunam kinchit udashtaya panchana ragam no chetwamiha ko janite kaka kandambaka pite chamre. Translation is O oh, cuckoo, don't always maintain a complete silence. Occasionally you should sing your fifth note, the sweetest one. If you don't do that, then how will people ever know you are in this mango tree full of cawing crows? <laughs> the import is that some advertisement is necessary for preaching. Our charyas say that our modern age is such that those who speak a lot can sell dust, whereas those who speak little cannot manage to sell even diamonds. Now in our shastras, we hear of the famous um, fifth note in music. This fifth note is often compared to the cuckoo's cry. In the Vedas, there are actually seven musical notes. They're known as swaras. They are as follows. Um, sa, ri, ga, ma, pa, da, ni. And each of these um, notes has a name. For example, sa is known as sadja. Ri has the name Rishaba, Ga has the name uh, Gandhara, Ma, Madhyama, Pa, the fifth note, the cuckoo, Panchama, Da is known as Dhaivata, and Ni is known as uh, Nishada. And in, uh, I guess you could say, Western music, we have the equivalent, uh, equivalent version of these notes as follows. We know Do, Re, Mi, Fa, So, La, T. So they correspond. So the equivalent of Do in Vedic Sanskrit is Sa, Re is Ri, Mi is Ga, Fa is Ma, So is Pa, the fifth note, La is Da, and T is Ni. It's a little technical, but it's interesting for uh, students of music. Now in Vedic music, each note is actually associated with the sound of a particular bird or animal. Sa is like the peacock's cry. Ri is the cow calling her calf. Ga is like the goat's bleat. Uh, ma is the heron's cry. Pa, of course, is the cuckoo's cry. Then, let me remember, uh, Da is the horse's neighing, and Ni is the elephant's trumpeting. So Shastra says that the cuckoo's cry, pa, is exactly like that of lovers uh, expressing their intense love for each other. The fifth note, pa, generates this, uh, this effect, this loving effect. Thus the acharyas say, it is the fifth note that produces the topmost emotion in the heart of Krishna's greatest lover, Srimati Radharani, since it reminds her of her loving pastimes with Krishna. Now, I was thinking of a corresponding verse uh, to that. And of course, it's there in CC, in Madhulila, text 176, where in that famous verse, Radharani ref refers to the fifth note, uh, uh, to, the, to the fifth note. We hear her say, My dear friend, now I have met my very old and dear friend Krishna on this field of Kurukshetra. I am the same Radharani, and now we are meeting together. It is very pleasant, but still, I would like to go to the bank of the Jamuna, beneath the trees of the forest there. I wish to hear the vibration of his sweet flute playing the fifth note within that forest of Vrindavan. Playing the fifth note within that forest of Vrindavan. Hare Krishna. Now there's a very nice pastime of Radha and Krishna, including cuckoo birds, which took place at Yavat, where Radharani lived after getting married to Abhimanyu. We, you may remember she lived there in that palace with her in-laws, Jatila, who was her husband's uh, mother, and Kotila, 
who was Abhimanyu's sister. And Radharani considered her home in Yava to be actually like a prison because her in-laws were always suspicious that she may try to meet Krishna. And it's a fact. Radharani was always trying to get out of Yava, out of the palace, to meet Krishna. And Krishna was always trying to get into the palace in Yava to meet Radharani. So, one day, um, Krishna, who we mentioned earlier resembles a, a black cuckoo, went to a part of the Vrindavan forest, to, to a part of the Vrindavan forest, to enlist the help of uh, the cuckoo birds there to help free Radharani from her prison in Yava. So there he called all the, the cuckoo birds by playing musical notes that sounded like the cuckoo singing. The acharyas say that soon all the cuckoo birds in Vrindavan joined him in a, a chorus that echoed throughout Braj. I also read that Krishna danced while playing his flute, which really excited the birds. <laughs> so then very soon the sound of the birds singing, combined with Krishna's flute playing, where he could also sing like, or make the sounds of the cuckoos, brought all the residents of Vrindavan to their rooftops to see what was going on, a big cacophony of sound. This included uh, Jatila, of course, who came out of her, the, her home, the palace, to see what was happening. Now on that day, Vishaka was visiting Radharani. So Jatila said to her, Vishaka, I have never heard cuckoos sing so beautifully before. So Vishaka said, yes, uh, for some reason the birds must be rejoicing. So Jatila nodded saying, yes, it is all exceptionally beautiful, isn't it? So at this point, Vishaka, who is described as very clever, suspected that Krishna might somehow be behind this um, cuckoo's festival. So she said to Jatila, uh, Mother, could myself and Radharani go to see what has excited these birds? We'll bring you back a report. So Jatila replied, Yes, dear, go ahead and enjoy seeing the cuckoos singing from close up. Then she said, But you come right back with Radharani. <laughs> That's Jatila. So when Vishaka told Radharani the plan, she Radha got dressed very quickly and her finest garments and ornaments and hurried off with Vishaka as well as other of her girlfriends to the forest. Now Shastra says that Radharani said nothing to these other girls about the prospect of meeting Krishna. However, the loud beating of her heart let her friends know that Krishna was on her mind. They didn't know, but they, they understood because the loud beating of her heart let her friends know that Krishna was on her mind. So as soon as everyone arrived at this the designated place in the forest, they were overwhelmed with the sound of cuckoo singing. In fact, the singing was so intense that it completely drowned out all other sounds. On top of that, the forest was so thick and so dense that at first the gopis became confused where the sound was coming from. But at last they noticed a tree that was covered entirely with blissful singing cuckoos. <laughs> and beneath the tree, lo and behold, stood Krishna directing this uh, choir of birds in their singing with his hands. So seeing that the gopis had arrived, Krishna you know, he lowered his hands and the cuckoos, uh, realizing that their purpose had been fulfilled, stopped singing. Then they just all looked around, you know, curious, what's going to happen next? Meanwhile, back in Yava, the, this abrupt ending to the cuckoo's singings startled Jatila. She thought, what a shame. These girls must have frightened the birds and made, this, made them stop singing. But of course, we know the cuckoos had not been frightened, but rather they were in bliss. As they crowded up together in the branches of the trees, feeling, it's described, privileged to watch a fresh new pastime of Radha and Krishna together that they had facilitated with their singing. Hare Krishna. In other words, every being in Vrindavan has some important service to render in the loving pastimes of Radha and Krishna. So those cuckoos, they were totally satisfied. 
So we'll finish today uh, with some words of one of my heroes, Srila Prabhupada Saraswati, in his Vindavan Mahimamrita, chapter 2. He writes, The groves of attractive trees and creepers laden with flowers and fruits of variegated colors, the attractive, intoxicating, blissful calls of many peacocks, cuckoos, and parrots, the many attractive lakes, rivers, mountains, and attractive bowers, and the attractive land made of gold and jewels have attracted me to Vrindavan. May my mind reflect upon Vrindavan, its clean earth made of the most colorful chintamani, its creepers and trees full of fruits and flowers, glowing with knowledge and bliss, its flocks of birds chanting the Samveda, and its rivers and lakes of spiritual rasa. Who would not serve the highest goal of Vrindavan, where Radha and Krishna, flattering each other in many ways, pluck flowers from trees and creepers with great joy while bathing in its lakes and playing with the birds? And playing with the birds. Hare Krishna. <laughs> wow. So we'll finish there. Um, actually, I, we're still in Rishikesh on the, on the banks of uh, Mother Ganges. We've been here almost three weeks. We just have, I think, three three days left. So we have mixed emotions. You know, it's it's ecstasy, and then we're lamenting. We may have to leave this seva very soon. It's been so wonderful. Three weeks, three weeks every night. Uh, four or five hundred Westerners are coming. Um, they're all here, as I've mentioned before, to learn about yoga. But they, by our advertising, by word of mouth. They come to our festival. We can't even put one more person in the hall. It's just totally packed. And um, we've just relish int relished introducing them to the chanting and making friendship with them. We've taken a lot of contacts. And of course, there's a delicious feast cooked every night. We're going to miss that service. But um, Krishna consciousness always gets better. Just after we end here, I'm taking 20 devotees to uh, Kathmandu, Nepal, to be with the devotees there and do Harinam, give out invitations, bring people back to the temple and do the same thing all over again forever. But we'll be back uh, in, in one week with, um, I think we could do one more class on the birds in Vrindavan. The stimuli for um, hearing about their service their st gives us the stimuli for developing love for Radha and Krishna. So thank you, <coughs> Prabhu. See you soon. Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Vrindavan Eshwari, Shimaji Radharani Ki, Mayapur Dham Ki, Shishi Gorni Tai Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtan Yaki Ki, Back Home, Back to God Yaki, Nitai Gorbhim Nandi, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe.